The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's presentation within Corsa. We have Robert Jones back with us with Left Brain Professionals, and today Robert will be speaking on the topic of building government contract indirect rates. Really great to welcome Robert back. We got excellent feedback last month with the first presentation that we worked on together. My name is Blake Briggson. I'll be your host for today, and I'll take us through the housekeeping items really quickly before we get rolling with the content of the presentation. Today's webinar is a one hour webinar, so to earn credit, CPE credit for today's event, you'll want to respond to at least three out of the four polling questions. And if you qualify for CPE credit, you'll be able to download your certificate from the Encorsa dashboard one hour after the conclusion of the event. If you have any questions about CPE or today's webinar, you can always email us at support at Encorsa.com. If you've had a chance to join us before, you know that we really like to make our webinars interactive. So if you navigate over to the questions pane on the GoToWebinar panel, um, you'll be able to see that that is a great spot for you to interact, either ask questions, let us know your experiences. And I see that we have Chuck from Olympia, Washington with us. Chuck's joined us before. And you know the drill, if you've joined us before, you can go ahead on out and let us know in that questions pane where you're joining from. We always um, are inspired to see that we have CPAs across the country and it's really fun to see where you're joining from. With that said, we'll go ahead and introduce our speaker for today. Today's speaker, as I mentioned, is Robert Jones. Really excited to have you back with us, Robert. Um, by way of introduction, Robert is a government contracts and accounting expert. He has more than 15 years of experience working with government and defense contracts, and he's held roles previously as controller, compliance officer, and, instruction, and instructor. So you'll really see today that Robert can help um, clients and companies from a lot of different perspectives, which really is incredibly helpful. If you're undergoing or if you're preparing for an audit, or even if you're just setting up your systems and your processes for compliance, Robert is really your go-to guy. So we're really happy to have you back with us again, Robert. And I'll turn things over to you um, from here. Maybe you can let the audience know real quick about your most recent LinkedIn post. Sure. Uh, and I see that I, I guess you've got the slides up. Yes. I'll Sorry, I don't see. It's oh, there it goes. Yep, minor. Uh, minor delay there we go and just make sure you can see my screen with the today we'll learn we can yes all right so again welcome thank you uh liz for the opportunity uh and as she said last uh last month was uh, a great uh introduction to the platform for us and we're happy to be back uh today we're talking about indirect rates for government contractors just another quick uh, little intro stuff about me and my firm. Uh, we are a boutique accounting firm located in Columbus, Ohio. We work only with government contractors um, and we specialize in the area of that extra layer of compliance. So I tell people when you're selling your products or services to the federal government, you have to deal with things like the federal acquisition regulation or the FAR. Uh, the FAR supplements that some of the agencies use and uh, some of the other unique things from an accounting perspective, such as the cost accounting standards. And that's uh, what we focus on. We work directly with clients. Uh, sometimes we work through other CPA firms. Uh, so to my other firms out there, if you've got some government contract clients uh, in your base uh, and you need some help, uh, don't hesitate to reach out because uh, we work quite often with some other firms as well. Uh, today, we're going to be talking about the indirect rates, uh, what cost pools are, the allocation methods that are allowable for, for distributing those costs uh, to customer jobs and projects. I'd like to start every presentation with uh, our positive share. So today, our quote is, we can complain because, roses, because rose bushes have thorns or rejoice because the thorns have roses, right? So it's all a matter of perspective uh, and how you look at the situation. Our learning objectives for today, we've got four of them. Uh, know the common cost pools utilized by government contractors. Identify the need for complex indirect rate structures. Uh, learn more about intermediate and advanced cost pools. 
and know the allowable allocation methods for indirect rates. So we're going to kick off. We've got a poll to get started here today. Liz, if you'll kick that one off for us. Yes, absolutely. So the first poll is launched. The question is, how much of your business is related to government contracts? And we'll leave that open for about 20 more seconds or so. And I can see the responses coming in here. It looks like um, we've got a fair amount that it's a small percentage. Uh, and actually there's a, looking like 24% uh, saying that a significant portion of their businesses and there's a bit of a gap in the middle there that's kind of interesting. So it's either kind of on the low side or on the high side, but not much in the middle. All right, well, thank you for that. It gives me, part of the reason I ask some of these questions is it gives me a sense of who's on the other end of the line, even though I can't see your faces, uh, helps me understand who I'm talking to. <clears throat> All right, so the common cost pools that we're gonna talk about today are fringe, overhead, and GNA. Oops, sorry. We're gonna jump ahead here and talk about fringe. So fringe costs are those costs of maintaining employees. And notice that I said maintaining employees, not hiring employees. So when we talk about HR costs, those belong somewhere else that we'll talk about later. Fringe are the costs of actually maintaining employees. And we think about things like employer taxes, uh, health insurance, retirement, whether that's a 401k or a SEP or a 403b. And then there can be some other benefits out there that you uh, may offer. Maybe you pay for gym memberships uh, for uh, your employees. Um, any of those kinds of things uh, fall into the fringe pool. And at the end of the presentation or the latter part of the presentation, I should say, we'll talk about how we're actually gonna allocate these methods out. So right now we're just talking about the cost collection uh, and the cost pools. <clears throat> the overhead, it are those costs of supporting customers or products. Uh, another way to think about them, these are the costs that are not attributable to a single customer or product. So for example, when we talk about cost of goods sold or in the government world, we tend to call them the direct costs. Um, those are things that are directly attributable to a single customer or product. Overhead, in contrast, are those costs that we cannot, that they otherwise sound and feel direct in nature. They, they have that feel of being a uh, cost of goods sold, but because I can't assign them to a single uh, customer or product, they become part of my overhead. The other, uh, some of the costs that fall into there are things like general support or bug fixes. So let's say uh, maybe you do uh, software, you've got a, a client that, that develops software. Uh, well, when they develop, when they're, uh, when they develop the original software, um, you know, they have some cost of goods sold, right, that, that you're going to allocate out and don't want to get deep into that of how you do that for uh, uh, direct costs. But once the product is out there, now they have to support it. Well, if they're supporting multiple customers who are using that software, right, if they're fixing a bug that a lot of people are going to benefit from, you can't directly attribute that to a single customer product. So now it has to become part of the overhead. Other things that fall in here are training for your employees, uh, idle time. Uh, idle time simply means, right, that they're not necessarily sitting around twiddling their thumbs, but idle time means that they're not directly billing to a customer project right now. Uh, one of the things that I say is if you, let's say you've got a manufacturing floor, <clears throat> maybe things are a little light on Friday and you take some of the crew and say, we're going to go back to the tool crib or we're going to go back to the, uh, uh, to the inventory cage and we're going to clean things up. We're going to reorganize things, right? That's not work that's directly attributable to our products uh, or to a customer project. And so that's idle time that gets charged into overhead. Facilities are another um, thing that get charged into overhead. We'll talk a little bit later in the advanced aspect of how facilities can be allocated differently. But what we're talking about here in the beginning are those basic uh, pools, again, fringe overhead and GNA, and kind of tackling this from small company, uh, first foray into government contracts and just getting started. Uh, our last general or our last basic pool, a common pool, is a general and administrative or GNA. 
Notice that it is not S GNA. We do not say sales general and administrative like many commercial companies do. In the government space, it is just GNA, uh, general and administrative. Uh, certain selling costs are unallowable, and which is a concept for a completely different uh, uh, presentation. And if Liz, we don't have that one on the list yet, we need to do uh, we need to get one on there for the unallowable costs. Um, but some of the sales costs are unallowable. So here we focus on uh, the allowable portion of GNA. These are the cost of operating the business. And I say it's the cost that you would incur regardless of customers, whether you had one customer or a thousand customers, uh, there are things that you would incur such as accounting, business development, HR, IT, legal. And when I was talking about fringe uh, a couple of slides back and I said that was the cost of maintaining employees, well, obviously we have a cost of hiring employees, so that becomes HR uh, and that falls here into the general and administrative area. And again, if you step back and think, right, you would incur these kinds of things. These are the costs that it takes to run the business regardless um, of any customers that you have. All right, let's kick off uh, that poll number two. It seems like we're going fast through these, but uh, I've got a lot of information ahead. So Liz, if you'll kick that off. Very good. So poll two is up. And the question is, is your general ledger currently organized into cost pools? So we'll leave this open. And I'm glancing there and we're hovering around the 56% saying yes, that's good. 27% are saying not needed. Okay, and we've got about 14% saying they're unsure. And, I, and, I, and for those that are somewhere in the no, not yet, or unsure, um, I'd uh, be curious to know why. And if you're interested and you want to throw something in the chat at me, that'd be awesome. But thank you for participating in that. All right, let's talk about the need for complex rates. We whizzed through the basics there um, on uh, fringe overhead and GNA. And I'll start this section by saying that what typically happens, one of the common uh, phone calls or emails that we get, uh, whether from a current client or from a potential new client, is they'll say things like, um, we're not as profitable as we think we should be, or you know, we're working on this, uh, you know, we've got a bunch of work and we're busy, but there's not as much money left at the end of the month, or uh, we know we're not as competitive with our rates uh, as some of our, you know, some of our competitors out there, and we're not really sure what's going on. And as we go in to work, we start peeling back the layers of the onion. What we usually find is that that simple rate model of fringe overhead and GNA doesn't work well when you try to spread that across uh, a complex organization. And so we're going to talk about what it means to be a complex organization, what some of the things are that are included. <clears throat> so I said that, you know, we get questions about reduced profitability, uh, loss of competitiveness and rates, uh, growing or expanding businesses. So if you're adding divisions or product lines, uh, looking for better fidelity in your rates, maybe you realize that you have uh, different or varying cost drivers among product lines or among uh, divisions or operating locations. Those are the kinds of things, you know, that, that develop that need for complex rates. And just a quick note about those, you know, uh, cost drivers. You know, sometimes a, a client will call and say, I know it takes, it's, it's, I spend more money on this one product line, but I can't really narrow it down. Um, they have a general sense of it, but they don't have the details uh, in order to answer the question. So what are some of the advanced cost pools? What are some things that companies can do? Uh, they can begin to look at having actually multiple fringe, uh, multiple overhead. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about intermediate cost pools. And then some companies uh, develop a material and subcontract handling rate or an MNSH rate. And I've got details on each of these in the following slides here. All right, so multiple fringe. Why might I have different fringe pools? So let's say you do SCA or non-SCA, and what I should have uh, put in here is this is the Service Contract Act. A little bit of history on this, and I'd be curious. We don't have an official poll, but if you want to throw something in the chat, 
how many of you are dealing with any SCA contracts? So SCA covered contracts or service contracts where um, the government has a, uh, a prescribed minimum wage and it's not, it's not your state or your local or national minimum wage, it's a separate minimum wage that's alloc uh, that is um, identified for that labor category by geography. The Department of Labor gives you what that rate is. And then there's also, and you get what's called a wage determination. Um, and then they also have a certain amount of fringe that you have to pay. So there is, you have to provide a certain level of benefits. And the reason uh, that, that some of these contracts exist, because some of these are things where uh, companies are providing uh, labor. Um, and in order to you know, keep contractors from coming in and just paying a bare minimum wage and not providing any benefits or any uh, cash in lieu of benefits, uh, these wage determinations exist. And so sometimes what happens is you'll have a commercial company who may pay very few benefits to somebody, but they get this SCA contract. Now they have to pay more. And so they've got a bunch of workers working on one or maybe multiple SCA contracts, but they still kind of have another division of the company that really is just their commercial work that they do that's unrelated to the business, unrelated to the government work. And so they might break out and say, okay, we're gonna have an SCA rate and a non-SCA rate because I have to pay more for these SCA employees and I don't want that messing up the rate that I bill out for my commercial work. <clears throat> Mentioned here, commercial versus government. Um, another reason you could potentially have multiple fringe rates, and it's really it's similar along the lines of the SCA versus non-SCA, but if you have different plans for different classes of employees, could be different operating divisions potentially, um, could be other ways that you legally have classes of employees and you have a written benefit plan that differs from class of employee to class of employee. And again, in that case, because you would want better fidelity in the rates uh, of the employees that you're charging out, that you're billing out to your customers, you might want to create multiple fringe pools uh, to capture that. So why might a company be looking at multiple overhead pools? So one of the reasons that we see are companies that have multiple locations, right? You can imagine that operating uh, an office in Columbus, Ohio, where I am, and compared to, let's say, Santa Barbara, California, where a buddy of mine is, right? The cost of operating those offices is quite different. If you're not familiar with the cost of living uh, and doing business in the state of California and in Santa Barbara, California, it is significantly higher than it is here in Columbus, Ohio. So if I, and, and with the premise that those geographic offices would be serving geographic clients, the rates that I would charge out of uh, my office in California would be different than the rates I would charge my clients based here in Columbus, Ohio because the cost of me maintaining that office in Santa Barbara is much higher than here. So I would set up different overhead pools so that I could capture uh, everything from labor, rent, utilities, all those stuff that we talked about uh, a few moments ago and, and what's included in the overhead pool. I would capture those costs separately uh, from the cost here in Columbus, Ohio. I might do it by division. This is where we see uh, a lot of our clients. Uh, we typically deal with small businesses. We do have a few large business uh, clients. Well, we deal typically with small business clients and many of them have only one location. So the first uh, option up here is usually not an issue for them. But many of them do manufacturing and engineering and they try to sell their engineering services. But when you have one overhead, right? And we think about manufacturing, what's something that manufacturers have? They have a lot of equipment usually, right? They have presses and lathes and trucks and lifts and cranes and all kinds of stuff, depending on what the nature of the work is that they do. And that stuff's expensive, right? So you've got depreciation on it, you've got all the repairs and maintenance, and that's a lot of, you know, overhead, right, on an organization. Versus the engineering side of the house, I always joke I can, you know, I can get a decent sized room and I can pack 40 engineers in there by putting up some cubicle walls and, you know, hand, giving them all laptops. 
my overhead for operating an engineering office is much lower than operating uh, a manufacturing facility. But if I only have one rate, if I only have one overhead, well, then my engineering division is unfairly bearing a portion, right, of the manufacturing costs. And so when I calculate that out and I try to get a billing rate, you know, and go to the market, well, now my billing rate for engineering is not competitive with other companies who may have already split out their stuff, or I might be competing with somebody that's only an engineering firm and doesn't have a manufacturing division. So this is one of the big areas where we usually get calls from clients is that they've got this uh, difference in manufacturing and engineering and they need to be more competitive. Um, when we get into the government, and I'm sure you could have this on the commercial world, but there's a lot of this in the government uh, space, you have a number of contracts where the contractor is simply providing staff to work at a government site. And the government eventually will say, and they won't necessarily say this right off if it's your first contract and you're a small contractor, um, but eventually they're gonna come along and say, hey, wait a minute, why are we paying overhead for your employees that's sitting in our facility? Your overhead uh, includes you know, your rent, your utilities, your snow removal and all that stuff but your employees, or at least some portion of them, right, are sitting at our facility where we're paying rent, we're paying the utilities, we're paying snow removal, why would we pay that to you? So they'll often go back to the contractor and say, we need you to develop a government site rate uh, or a customer site rate versus the contractor site, right? And if we hire, if we need help from uh, your employees who are based at your site and you're doing the work at your site, we'll pay that rate. But if we're getting employees who are working at our site, we're going to pay, pay our site rate. And if you think about, you know, back to the first bullet up there, it's really very similar to that. You're just creating another location and saying, I have this location called a customer site or a government site that is not going to have any rent or utilities or uh, snow removal and other stuff in there because I'm not incurring any of those costs for that location. So in fact, you may have, <clears throat> uh, you could have multiple locations over your own. Maybe you have offices uh, that are yours, but you also have some customer sites that you support. You could have a mixture uh, of rates and uh, locations of your own. Maybe you have. We may be experiencing some audio delays. Not, uh, uh, these are not mutually exclusive in how they are configured. All right. Uh, intermediate cost pools. This gets to be uh, an interesting one and a fun one. And usually this comes after the previous, right? So I'm gonna back up a slide for just a moment here. You know, usually somebody comes along, and I'm gonna back up a couple of slides actually. So the multiple fringe, we don't see much of that. Um, in fact, I think I can say with all of our existing clients that we don't have anybody who is maintaining multiple fringe accounts. And if somebody were to do it, it would probably be primarily for that SCA versus non-SCA. When we talk about the multiple overhead, we do have clients um, who are doing that. It's usually kind of the next step in the progression uh, from common cost pools. They, again, many don't do a multiple fringe. They end up in a multiple overhead. And the next layer of complexity that comes along is an intermediate cost pool. And one of the common ones here that we're going to talk about is facilities. So, um, and again, this will often come up with manufacturing versus engineering. Uh, as you, many of you probably well know, manufacturing facilities tend to be larger, right? They're, they're these big, huge buildings. They got high ceilings. They're expensive to heat. They take up a lot of uh, 
you know, uh, square footage. Um, there's a lot of stuff that goes into maining that space versus I could go somewhere and get a small office, put up some cubicle walls, put my engineers in there. They don't necessarily need a lot of space because they don't have that equipment, right? They don't have trucks and cranes and lathes and presses and whatever the other stuff that's going on in manufacturing. <clears throat> So what will happen, and the argument that I've heard along the way, is that uh, the director of engineering will come to a meeting and say, I'm tired of paying half of the electric bill and half of the rent and half the depreciation when my engineers are only occupying 25% of the building. It's those manufacturing people out there. They're the ones who, right, they've got three-fourths of the building. They're using three-fourths of the utilities and all the stuff. Why am I paying for part of their stuff? So what we'll end up doing is we'll create this intermediate pool uh, called facilities. Uh, we capture things in there like rent, depreciation, utilities, right? Those things that would, you, when you think about a facility. And then we allocate that over square footage, right? So the engineering division that occupies 25% of the building, well, they're gonna pay now 25% of the facility costs. And the manufacturing division that occupies 75% of the building, they're gonna now bear 75% of the cost for the facilities. Another one that we've seen uh, for an intermediate cost pool is IT. Uh, again, kind of a similar situation, came up with a client. It was actually the reverse this time. The director of manufacturing came in and said, I'm tired of paying for all the IT costs. I never can find those people when I need them because every time I need somebody from IT, they're over there helping those engineers because all those engineers, they all have got three, four, five devices. They've got desktop and a laptop and they got these network analyzers and they got tablets and all these things that they're doing is engineering over there and so the IT folks are constantly over there troubleshooting issues I don't have that many problems out here because I don't have that many computers but boy when there is a problem I can never find them and why am I paying for them and so similar to what we did with facilities we took all of the IT costs and you'll notice and you could have if I just go back a slide, you'll notice I did not include labor here in facilities. You could. Um, actually, for that particular client, they did have labor in facilities because they had two full-time people. That's all their job was, was maintaining facilities. So if you had staff that did that, you could certainly include that in here. In the IT world, uh, all of the IT salaries uh, went into here, as well as the cost for I should have said enterprise equipment as well as enterprise software. And I said the enterprise software to be clear that things like the ERP system, timekeeping, those things that everybody or that the company as a whole benefits from uh, goes into IT. Uh, there can be IT specific costs in uh, those other overheads for manufacturing and engineering. So let's say for example, You've got an engineer that needs a CAD program, right? That only engineering is going to benefit from. You don't have any manufacturing users. You don't have any uh, accounting users or others who are in the uh, CAD program. That would go into their overhead. Um, this IT here, again, would be the stuff that's enterprise-wide that the, the entire organization benefits from. <clears throat> so you gather all of those costs. And one way that you could uh, allocate it out, uh, and it's easy to do, uh, is either over devices or the number of network connections, right? Because everything that connects to your network has to have a MAC ID, or right? that's the ID that, um, it's kind of a, basically the serial number for that uh, device, um, so that when there's network communication and network traffic, it knows where to send it. Your IT folks can log into your network and tell you the number of devices uh, that are connected. You could identify those devices uh, by department. And then just, and, and obviously again, as I said, with engineers and, and not uncommon, right? You've got engineers who have desktops and laptops and phones, and they've got network analyzers and other tools uh, that they're using uh, in the engineering side that are connected to the internet or at least connected to the intranet. Um, and they require, you know, more of those IT resources to support them. All right, let's jump ahead to uh, another poll here. Liz, do I help there, I think? Yes, can you hear me okay? Yes, can now, yes. Good, the poll is open, and the question is, do you utilize any of these advanced cost pools? 
Looks like the responses are coming in pretty quickly, so thank you for that. Um, yeah, and interestingly, we've got about 50% of the people, give or take, saying none of the above. Um, and kind of what I expected, we had a few who were saying multiple fringe, that you, we don't usually see much of that. Um, and we're seeing some multiple overhead and intermediate cost pools, so that's good. Yeah, thank you. For those who are saying none, I'd be curious how many of you, maybe at the end of this presentation, think that you need to uh, implement these at your organization. All right, um, we'll move ahead here a little bit and talk about allocating these dollars. So, kind of work through some of the other stuff uh, a little quickly. Um, now, we, I really want to talk about how do you allocate indirect costs. So. When we talk about indirect costs, um, one of the phrases that you're hearing in the government space, or a couple of phrases, one is that there has to be a logical, causal, beneficial relationship between the cost pool and the cost base, right? And so in order to calculate a rate, um, we have to capture, we have to collect the costs in the pool, and then we have to allocate them out over some other base of dollars, right? And mathematically, that's going to give us our rate. So the pool is the numerator, the base is the denominator, and math is going to tell us what the rate is. Um, we have to have, and you notice that I said it was a logical, causal, beneficial relationship. So what does that mean? It means that there has to be, you're incurring those costs for some reason, and you have to allocate those costs out based upon the reason that you collected them. In the case of fringe here, uh, and this is always uh, one, notice what I put in parentheses. I said fringe is allocated over all W-2 labor. I didn't say labor, I said all W-2 labor. That means uh, this is your employee labor. And if, and I don't wanna scroll because it's too many slides back, but if you'll recall from the fringe, slide when I had it up there, what did I say was included in fringe? Employer taxes, uh, retirement benefits, health insurance. So who benefits from that? Your W-2 employees. Who does not benefit from that? Your temporary labor, your subcontractors, right? They work for somebody else and somebody else pays uh, those, those expenses. If you go to Robert Half, uh, for example, and get some temporary labor to help in, you know, the accounting department, or you go to Kelly Services or whoever and get, you know, some labor to help in manufacturing or wherever, those are employees of Robert Half or Kelly Services or some other company. Um, you pay a flat rate out for them uh, that includes those costs that are already rolled up. So we always wanna make sure that our fringe is allocated only over W-2 labor. Uh, one of the things that I will tell you here is to make sure that in your general ledger, you clearly have uh, your labor accounts identified as to what is employee labor versus temporary or subcontract labor. Uh, in fact, what I always, one, always make sure that your labor accounts have the word labor in the description so that it's clear what they are. Do not commingle other expenses in there. Uh, and by that, I mean, let's say, for example, you have a training account and overhead. If you want to track your training labor, um, and you probably should be tracking your training labor, it needs to be in a separate account from your the, the cost of the class itself, right? So don't just create a single account that says training and dump the labor and the travel and the cost of the class all in one account. Um, at the very least, the labor portion needs to be broken out because we have to be able to identify that to properly calculate the rates. And as well, make sure that if, you've, if you're using temporary labor or you've got subcontractors that are doing work, that you identify that in the uh, description of the account and the title of the account so that when we go to calculate and pull the stuff over, we're pulling over the correct uh, the, the correct amounts. All right, so a little bit of background there. What are the allowable allocation methods for fringe? Um, either labor dollars or labor hours. Notice that I said labor dollars is the most common. It tends to reduce variances. It will not eliminate them. 
Um, basically what you're doing, what you should be doing uh, is creating a budget uh, in advance that's going to uh, tell you what your provisional billing rates are for the year. That's what you're going to use uh, to bill your customers. <clears throat> so you calculate what uh, your expected salaries are going to be, what your expected fringe and overhead and, and such is. As we're talking here, we're going to figure out what our expected fringe rate is. Um, Typically, we don't have significant variances in the dollars unless there is a lot of unplanned overtime. I mean, if you have planned overtime, that should be calculated into your budget. And obviously, when we have exempt employees, right, those salary employees that don't get paid overtime, uh, their salary amount, their dollars do not change regardless of the number of hours that they work and the number of billable hours that we get out of them to bill back to our clients. Um, so if you use labor dollars to calculate that rate, that's why I say that it reduces the variance. If you use labor hours in calculating your rate, well, then you've got to be much more accurate because if you have any variations uh, or fluctuations, I should say, in the amount of billable work, the amount of direct work uh, that you're doing, then you're going to underabsorb or overabsorb fringe um, and you have a chance to get out of whack pretty quickly with that. <clears throat> All right, uh, allocating overhead, we have six options here. Uh, one of these, the first is units of production, right? So if you've got a production line, um, you could have, again, multiple overheads for each production line. Let's say you had I'm going to make up something on the fly here. Let's say that uh, you processed uh, juice and milk and butter, for example, and you developed three overhead lines, you developed three overheads that aligned with these three product lines, the production lines that you had, and you know you got so many pounds of butter, so many gallons of milk, so many gallons of orange juice, right? You could uh, allocate your overhead costs uh, based on that. Um, you can allocate your overhead based on labor dollars, right? And, when, and notice I said it's direct labor dollars. Uh, I want to go back up for just a moment to the previous slide on fringe to clarify the difference here. Fringe is on all labor, right? Because all of our labor, regardless of whether they are direct or indirect, benefit from fringe. So that is all labor. Uh, whereas when we're talking about overhead, we're allocating that over direct labor, uh, and it could be direct labor dollars or direct labor hours. Um, I would say for my service industries to, uh, that are out there, we're doing it over direct labor dollars, again, primarily for the same reasons that we do fringe over dollars. Uh, you could do it over direct material costs. Uh, that would make sense if you were in an environment where material was a significant portion uh, of your costs. Uh, obviously, when we're talking about service industries, material is either non-existent or is uh, so minor that it's basically an ODC. It's another direct cost. It's usually something minor that we're passing through. Um, Prime costs, and so those are direct labor and direct material could be combined. You could allocate it over that. Uh, we have a client that takes this approach because the material that they have, uh, they do a significant amount uh, of value add to that material. So they, they buy material in. Uh, they configure uh, this material. They take all, and even though some of it is commercial, um, off the shelf, out of the box kind of stuff. They actually take everything out of the box. They resell it. Uh, they install their own software on it when they sell it to the customer. So their customer is buying a complete system. Their intellectual property really is software, and that. And, but they sell a complete package. And because they test every piece of equipment that comes in, they load the software on it, they verify that the configuration works as it's supposed to work. Uh, we include the direct material cost in it, not just the labor hours. And then the last option here would be machine hours. Again, if you had, um, you know, machines, let's say you had a, a machine that could make thousands of widgets uh, an hour, and, and that's, uh, you know, and you had these very expensive machines that were doing that. Let's say a worker could maintain four, five, six machines, so your labor 
uh, per machine and per unit of stuff going out is relatively minimal, but you really have maybe millions of dollars invested in these uh, high-tech, high-speed machines, it might make sense to allocate uh, overhead over machine hours in that situation. All right, uh, GNA. Um, when we talk about allocating GNA, we have two methods here. Um, the first is total cost input or TCI. This is the most common. Uh, you'll find certainly pretty much all your small, I would say all of them. You'll find a significant number of your small businesses that are doing this. Um, they get uh, uh, total cost input is pretty much what it sounds like, right? It's total cost. Your GNA is spread over all of your direct costs and all of the um, associated overhead on those direct costs. Value added, and I realized here, I think I missed adding a slide. Uh, so I'm gonna have to back up and uh, just tell you a little bit about, um, we didn't talk about M and SH, or that material and subcontract handling. So we're gonna take a slight diversion for the moment. I apologize that I realized that slide is now missing. So M and SH, material subcontract handling, we were talking about those uh, intermediate cost pools. Some companies uh, will eventually realize that they are doing a lot of pass-through materials and pass-through subcontracts to the government. Uh, they will, and I won't, I won't get into the limitation on pass-through, which is a whole legal question we could talk about, uh, but companies will oftentimes, part of what their contract is, is that they're procuring a fair amount of materials for the government. And the government will pay companies to do this, sometimes because they're actually paying for the service of somebody to do the procurement for them, uh, pack, maybe repackage stuff, maybe they're buying stuff from multiple places and coordinating. There are various reasons why the government would do that. Uh, it can also be that sometimes companies, if you think about like an IT company, they might actually be selling a lot of services and materials, right? So the government comes in, buys the IT service, and along the way, the provider says, well, you need a new server, or you need a new you know, hardware, or whatever it is that, that somebody needs. They'll have line items on their contracts to procure the hardware in addition to the services. Um, in those cases, uh, the government will say, well, I'm not gonna pay for a bunch of markup, right? You're just getting a server off the shelf. You're bringing it here, you're installing it. Why would I pay you a bunch of overhead to do that? Um, things like material ODCs and travel that are passed through are usually, this is subject to terms of the contract, but are usually burdened with GNA. Uh, and one of the things that will happen with companies is as they grow, uh, that GNA rate will get a little high and, and I'll even say potentially even a little out of control. Part of that happens because uh, you get some high paid people in the accounting business development area, that rate starts to go up. Um, and there's no magical rate that I can tell you that in and of itself is high, but I'll tell you kind of when you start getting above the 20% uh, range, give or take, it starts to get a little uncomfortable for some of your clients and they say, wait a minute, why am I paying a 20% markup for you to pass this stuff through? That doesn't make a lot of sense. Uh, and oh, by the way, you've all, you're also not only handling all these all this material, but you're managing these subcontracts for us. Why are we paying such an, an overhead rate and a GNA rate on this stuff? So what'll happen is the, the company the contractor sets up this material and subcontract handling, and so they take the cost of managing that. So you take like your con subcontract administrators, you take your buyers, you put those expenses into a pool, and then the base of that pool. Uh, are the, is the material that they're passing through and the subcontracts that they're passing through. And so you develop this MSH rate that is applied to those items uh, passing through. When you do that, by default, brings us to the screen where we are here in the second bullet. When you do that, by default, you end up with a value added GNA because if you've created this other cost pool where you've subtracted out, as you notice here, I said that value added equals TCI minus material and subcontract costs. And so if you're gonna take that out and apply it somewhere else, then by default you ended up, uh, you've changed the mathematical formula here, and you've ended up with a value added, uh, for value added uh, GNA. 
All right, um, another poll here, Liz. Is this the one that we were gonna do offline? Um, this is actually our final polling question. So oh, we, this is we can launch that. The offline poll question was about um, how the audience allocates overhead. So specifically, okay. let me- Yeah, I think we've got a couple more slides, yeah. Yeah, so let's go ahead and just ask that question to the audience. So for, um, based upon what Robert's been talking about, you know, how do you allocate? So some of the responses that might be applicable to you, if you wanna go ahead and just let us know in the questions box, um, might be units of production, direct labor dollars, direct labor hours, direct labor, um, rather direct material costs, prime costs, and also machine hours. And um, yep, so Robert, it does say, I saw your note, the poll isn't working. This is not an official poll. This isn't one of our four polls. We just uh, wanted to have a little bit of audience discussion. So thanks everyone for your responses so far. It looks like um, we're seeing mostly direct labor hours coming through so far, Robert. Um, and we do okay. have uh, machine hours as another response as well. Yeah, I can see a few of those coming through. And, and it's pretty common that direct labor, um, and so those, those of you who are saying direct labor, I'm wondering, uh, so somebody said direct labor hours. Okay, so we do have a few people who are saying hours. Uh, for those that didn't say one way or the other, I'd be curious how many are hours versus dollars. But uh, yeah, great. Uh, so the last uh, poll then that I think that we've got up here is, uh, uh, do you need help with government contract indirect rates, whether you are a um, government contractor yourself or maybe um, you've got clients if you're working in a firm, uh, maybe you have clients. Uh, just curious how many of you think that you need help in this area. Then we'll open up to uh, some Q&A. Excellent. Very good. So that fourth polling question is now launched on the screen for the audience to respond to. Um, again, as Robert said, do you need help with government contract indirect rates? And Robert, while this polling question is open, um, you do work quite frequently with accounting professionals, correct, who serve contractors. And do you want to talk a little bit about that working relationship? Yeah. So, you know, as I opened up, I said, uh, you know, that we're a boutique accounting firm. We do work with government contractors. Uh, we practice primarily accounting system design, implementation, and audit support. We really work uh, on that government contract compliance side of accounting. Um, so what's interesting in our relationships uh, and whether I meet, meet a client through a CPA or I think we meet clients directly, is I always say we're going to have a conversation with uh, your existing CPA because most companies, uh, you know, they have somebody that they're using for tax or payroll or both. Um, and so what I, what I tell people as well is what we don't do. We don't do taxation at our firm. We don't do uh, outsourced payroll or outsourced accounting. We don't do monthly write-up work. Um, it's not our area of expertise. Um, and so I always like to make uh, make the CPA on the other end of the phone comfortable that we're not here to steal any business away from anybody, um, that we actually work well together. And usually I hear a couple of sighs of relief on the phone and that the uh, uh, other CPA says, they're not going to stay, they're not stealing my client away from me, right? That's a good thing. Um, and in fact, usually what many of them will step up and say is, I'm glad they finally hired somebody who understands government contracts because we've been trying to help them, but that's not our area of expertise and, and we're probably not the best ones to give them the advice in that area. Um, so we do have good relationships with uh, other CPAs um, and it works out well. Great, thanks. I think that's a really helpful um, background explanation. So we went ahead and closed down that fourth polling question. And I think that brings us to the Q&A segment. Is that right? Yep. Very good. Well, I have seen some questions come through from the audience. So um, do you have any specifically that you'd like to address first or would you like me to read a couple? Uh, if you want to read them, I can only see one line of them for some reason. I'm not sure what's going on on my end. Okay, yeah, absolutely. So we'll go ahead, take some questions, and then um, if anyone else has questions while we get started, feel free to just type them in the questions box. Um, so first of all, um, this is a question coming in from Carrie, and she's asking about, um, do you use a specific cost accounting software to calculate your rates or maybe approaches that you might recommend for someone to use software to do this? 
So in the government contract space, um, you know, if you're a small company, we've got a lot of clients that are on QuickBooks. Uh, unfortunately, QuickBooks does not have built in the ability to calculate rates and, and as many uh, other commercial software that's out there, even your larger ones like uh, SAP and uh, Oracle and stuff, uh, they're not designed for government contractors. And so they're not designed to calculate these uh, indirect rates and provide those reports to you. It uh, doesn't mean it can't be done. Um, you know, as we work with our small clients, we usually just uh, build them tools in Excel. We've got some basic ones that we have, show them how to plug in the data from their uh, system and calculate the rates. If you are on QuickBooks, there actually is an overlay program called iCAT, and you can read more about it at iCATsystems.com, or if you'll shoot me an email, uh, be happy to connect you. We uh, have a good working relationship with that team. And that's uh, one of those add-on programs that actually reads the data from QuickBooks and will provide the reporting and calculations for you. If you're doing a lot in the government contract space and maybe you're looking to change software, there are some software out there that are designed specifically for government contractors and they have this functionality for the indirect rates, uh, the reporting, as well as uh, some of the stuff to help you with your incurred cost proposal at the end of the year. And just a quick plug, and I think you're going to mention it, uh, Liz, but the next presentation that we're doing uh, within course in September is going to be on the incurred cost proposal. Very good tie in there. Yes. Thank you for that question. We have another question that came in from Teresa a little bit, um, a little bit ago. And I, I mentioned that we would save it for Q&A. So this relates to the W-2 expenses and the conversation around direct labor. And Teresa yes. is wondering, so if a company utilizes a professional employer organization, um, how does that work classifying the W-2 labor since technically the employees receive that W-2 from the PEO? I would say it would still be the same. I guess it depends on our... Uh, I assume, and it's been a while since I worked with the PEO, uh, I have, but it's been a number of years. I believe when we received uh, our monthly invoice that there was a breakdown of the labor costs, the benefits, and then obviously you're paying a fee to them to manage that. If you're getting that detail, I would say that you would break it down that way, that it would still be your direct cost. You would still have, even though you're not paying the fringe expenses directly, that those are coming through somebody else, you can identify what those expenses are, uh, put those into your fringe pool, and then the uh, fee that you're paying for the PEO to manage it uh, would be a G&A expense, much like a, an HR kind of expense. Very good. We have another question um, about indirect costs for federal grants. So would you recommend any CPA firms that are familiar with negotiating a rate with the feds? So I think that's more about, you know, if a CPA firm is supporting a client that is working with federal uh, grants, um, how familiar should that CPA firm be with negotiating the rate? Uh, what I would say they definitely need to understand uh, the whole realm of government contracts and, and, and government grants, uh, those cost principles, uh, what the sticky points are. Uh, I'll tell you, you know, so the CPAs, uh, and I'm going to go on the assumption that everybody on the call here is CPAs, right? We all took the test and, you know, one of the things that we're licensed to do a lot of stuff, but remember, you know, it has to be something that we're trained in, right, in order to really be able to do that work. Um, I've had a couple of CPAs call me and say, well, can you give me a, can you give me the quick and dirty so I can go and do this on my own? And it's, it's kind of hard. <laughs> um, I mean, I can certainly point you to the FAR and, and the stuff to read and learn and take classes, but it's something that is going to come over time. And if you don't have, uh, if you haven't worked in that area or haven't taken the classes in that area, I would say uh, um, it, it's just not going to, it's not something you're going to take one class or one seminar and be done with it. Um, there, there are a lot of nuances in how the government operates. Um, when we talk about indirect rates and, this, and especially when we uh, do the presentation on, on allowable costs, it's a foreign concept to a lot of CPAs and to a lot of uh, government contractors. And the way the government audits those and what they're looking for 
um, can be tricky at times. And we have a follow-up question on that coming in from Carrie, wondering if left brain professionals helps with negotiating rates with entities, whether it's a grant, the federal government, or perhaps more specifically, the Department of Health and Human Services. Yes, that is definitely something that we do. Great, thank you. Um, another question just came in from Miriam, um, wondering, are all cost pools required to be set up if you are just doing State Department of Transportation versus the DCAA? Uh, excellent question. I will tell you, if you're doing work with your state, uh, DOT, they are getting federal dollars, and so they are flowing down those requirements. Uh, in fact, most of your states, there are a few that are not, but most of your states are following the AASHTO guidelines, A-A-S-H-T-O, and please don't ask me what it stands for because I forget at the moment, but it's something like the American Association of State Highway Patrol or State Highway Transportation something uh, organizations. Um, there are specific guidelines uh, in that guide, and if you Google the AASHTO guide, again, A-A-S-H-T-O, or if you get a hold of me, I'd be happy to point you there. Um, because your state DOTs are getting federal DOT money, they have to essentially flow down the same requirement. Um, and in fact, you'll probably see the phrase FAR 31 compliance in your DOT contracts. And it's essentially the exact same rules as the, at the federal level. Very good. Now let's see. So we were able to talk about that. We have a couple questions that came in from Scott Page. And Scott is wondering regarding ASC 842. So these are the new lease accounting standards. Oh, yes. We'll yep. be coming up. Um, wondering about amortization of the leased asset. Would that be classified as overhead, GNA, or um, facility costs? Where would that, or would it be an unallowable expense? How would that typically be categorized? So the depreciation portion, so if we're talking about that and we were looking at how we would otherwise do depreciation and in and, and a similar vein, it's gonna to go to where the asset is being used, uh, right? So if we're leasing a building, then I would say it's gonna go into facilities. If we're leasing equipment that's being used by manufacturing, um, then those costs would go into the manufacturing um, uh, overhead. That makes a lot of sense. So it depends, but with some very logical guidelines to follow um, where the building is being, where the building's costs are being recorded. That makes a lot of sense. We have time for one more question, and we have one from Joseph. Joseph works um, within a hospital system and utilizes hospital cost reporting. And he was wondering okay. about the step down of overhead to intermediate overhead areas. Well, I'm going to first say that I'm not familiar with any specifics of hospital cost accounting. So I don't know that I could answer that. If you want to shoot me a question offline, um, our website there is leftbrainpro.com. You can also, and this is open to everybody, uh, if you go to our website and scroll down, you can schedule a call with me. Um, and so if you've got a question like this that maybe needs a little more that we can address through here, grab 15 minutes off my calendar and be happy to chat about it. Excellent. And that kind of segues to the, the final question and point is how can the audience get in touch with you? I know that you maintain um, a vibrant presence on LinkedIn and then also Twitter and Facebook. And it, you want to tell us a little bit more about that? Sure. You can also, uh, we've got the got it on the screen here. If you go to leftbrainpro.com, uh, if you see they've got the slash and course uh, hyphen rates hyphen 19, you can download this presentation. I know uh, Liz is going to send out a recording later, which is awesome. Uh, we keep all of our uh, copies out there as well. When we do presentations, if there's links uh, to other tools or uh, authoritative guidance. We have those links directly available to you. This presentation today only had a couple of links. Uh, some of the presentations have a little more than others. Um, but yes, you can uh, get a hold of us there and uh, follow us, as uh, Liz said, on any of the uh, social media platforms. Excellent. Thank you, Robert, for an excellent presentation today. And it was really fun to have an audience that was really interactive and really brought great questions as well. So we really appreciate that. 
Um, also, we have up on the screen right now um, Robert's contact information, Robert at left brain, excuse me, leftbrainpro.com. And then also Melissa is one of your colleagues as well. And her email address is Melissa at leftbrainpro.com. That's correct. Yes. And thank you. We appreciate the opportunity. Our pleasure. Just to close with a few housekeeping items, um, a few reminders. Um, there will be a course survey, a short survey following the program when you close the GoToWebinar browser. So we'd love your feedback. If you can go ahead and just give us your feedback, let us know what topics you might be interested in learning more about in the future. And also don't forget to log into your Encorsa dashboard an hour after the presentation, you'll be able to download your CPE certificate. As Robert mentioned, the recording for today's program, as well as the handouts, will also be available to you from your Encorsa dashboard. So that, those are great resources for you to take as reference and share them with your colleagues as well. We have some excellent presentations coming up over the next month, and we're really excited to welcome Robert back on September 10th at 1 p.m. to talk about Encard. Um, and can you tell us a little bit more about our September 10th presentation? It's Encard cost? Yes, the incurred cost proposal, really uh, short and sweet, is that uh, it's a form, uh, actually it's an Excel file with more, many tabs in it where you reconcile your actual costs incurred against what you build to your government clients and figure out whether you underbuild the government or overbuild the government and by how much. Very good. So that registration link will be emailed to the audience um, following the conclusion of the presentation today. So again, Robert, really appreciate your time. Looking forward to having you back next month. And thanks to the audience for joining us. Hope you all have a wonderful rest of the day and we'll talk to you soon.